Alderman Jean Baptiste? Here. Alderman Wynn? Alderman Wilson? Here. Alderman Holmes? Here. Eight to one. We have a quorum. Alderman Wynn is on her way. Um, I have no public announcements, but I do have a <coughs> proclamation. The week of November 14th to 20th is National Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week in Evanston as well as throughout the nation. And I have a Veterans Day in Evanston 2010 proclamation. Whereas Veterans Day is November 11, 2010, and the city of Evanston and its citizens would like to thank and remember all veterans, men and women who have served and are currently serving in our armed forces. And whereas Four Seasons Garden Club of Evanston is contributing 500 large yellow Carlton daffodil bulbs in memory of Alan Bow and Wilhelmina Price, and whereas daffodils in the language of flowers say regard and respect, and whereas the Garden Club is inviting all Evanstonians to Patriots Park immediately after the veterans ceremony at Fountain Square on November 11, 2010, and whereas to participate in the planting of the daffodils as a remembrance each spring when the daffodils bloom to express regard and respect to all veterans and the contributions made by our armed forces, city leaders, and fellow residents. Now, therefore, I, Elizabeth B. Tisdall, Mayor of the City of Evanston, do hereby proclaim November 11, 2010, as Veterans Day in Evanston, and encourage all residents to participate in the planting of daffodils at Patriots Park. Witness under my hand and corporate seal of Evanston, Illinois. Uh, Virginia Beatty, would you come up? And I would like to present you with this proclamation. And everybody, these are from the Garden Club for all of us, so that's why you have these bags. Turn around. What are we supposed gotta to get do? It, we've got to get it right. Ooh, ooh. Oh, come here. Thank you, dear leader. <laughs> <laughs> the only time I've ever how, how, how about him in the background? Do I no. Have <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, you all have daffodils here. We so all you could all plant them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, daffodils do very, very well. They'll keep coming back all the time. Just the way some people here keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. City Manager, do you have public announcements and presentations? Yes, Madam Mayor, I do. Good evening. Uh, several items. First, uh, we have a presentation uh, by a number of uh, young people affiliated with the Fleetwood Jourdain uh, Community Center. Uh, they held a uh, bake sale to, uh, to raise money for the United Way, and uh, Doug is pointing. If there are representatives, if those young folks are here, if they wouldn't mind stepping forward, and I believe I saw um, Alexander Rovita from United Way of the North Shore also here, so please come on up. Why don't you wait a second for your colleagues? Come on up, come up, don't be shy. Tisdale and elected officials. My name is Awa Jahate and I attend Nichols Middle School. I am 11 years old and, I'm, and I am the Vice President of the Fleetwood Jordan Middle School Council. For the past three years we have served food to the homeless and had many clothing drives. And recently we, ha we have successfully petitioned for bus shelters on the corner of Emerson and Dewey. I would now like to introduce Hadis Essay. Thank you. 
Good evening, Mayor Tisdale and elected official. My name is Hodges to say I attend Shoot Middle School, and I am 12 years old. I am the treasurer of the Fleetwood Jordan Middle School Counselor. We are happy to present the United Way we, with $130 that we raised from our big sale. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Do you want to say anything else? I just want to say on behalf of United Way, if this is the youth that's leading us in tomorrow, into tomorrow, I'm very inspired. Thank you so much. Alderman Rainey. Madam Mayor, before you all leave, don't leave yet. Could could we have someone explain to the kids about watching themselves on streaming video on the internet? Because they are going to be on TV. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Mayor Alderman Rainey, if you would like to watch us on the internet, and watch yourself on the internet, you go to cityofevanston.org and there's a link on that site and you'll be able to see it as it's replayed. It'll also be on YouTube, so you'll now also be on YouTube. Uh, and that'll be up uh, probably later tomorrow. So. Um, we can, uh, Betsy can get you the, the information for that. But maybe to follow up on Alderman Rainey's point, uh, this is the first city council meeting of Evanston to be streamed live on the internet. Uh, so wherever you are in the world, if you want to tune in on uh, what's happening now uh, with the Evanston City Council with video, uh, you can now get us at uh, cityofevanston.org. Uh, this is all being done through the Evanston Community Media Center, so we thank Steve Bartlebaugh and, and his uh, folks there for making that possible. Uh, next, uh, Marty Lyons, the Assistant City Manager and City Treasurer, is here to make a presentation of uh, the Distinguished Budget Award, which the city recently received from the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada. Good evening, Mr. City Manager, Madam Mayor, members of Council. Uh, tonight we are presenting with you the uh, Government Finance Officers Distinguished Budget Award for 2010-11. Uh, so this is the year immediately that, that we're in right now. Um, the City has been receiving this award for the last several years. The award is um, um, applied for by state, county, municipal, and specialty districts. It is a uh, um, an award that you must satisfy a variety of cr criteria, most dealing with the readability and um, with the amount of information provided in your budget document. So this is a document award. This year's, our challenge was uh, to change our document substantially. Um, we went from 650 pages plus down to just over 200 pages and still come up with our information in that document. So we did that and we applied and still received the award. One of the things that I think GFOA will need to do a little bit of catching up on is what we did as far as our public process went. And we did include our public process, all of the new, um, the, the meetings before council meetings started as far as generating interest, talking about the issues facing the city before we got into what would be called the statutory budget calendar. So that's in our policies, and I anticipate that that will also be something that moves forward in GFOA distinguished budgets in those documents themselves. Thank you very much, but you really should have this, Marty. You earned it. Uh, next, uh, Doug Gaynor, the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Community Services, is here to uh, uh, fill the community in on our upcoming Veterans Day ceremony. Mr. Gaynor, good evening. Thank you, City Manager, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. As uh, uh, noted in the proclamation, the Veterans Day ceremonies will be held at Fountain Square in downtown Evanston on Thursday, November 11th. An assembly will begin at 10 a.m. Uh, we expect this uh, ceremony to end at about 11.15. In keeping with the time-honored traditions of past ceremonies, there will be uh, non-denominational non reflections, some singing, and some remarks by elected officials, 
and the leaders of local veterans groups such as the Evanston American Legion Post 42, Tech Sergeant William B. Snell, VFW Post 7186, and Vietnam North Suburban Chapter. A color guard and rifle team will represent the Northwestern University NROTC contingent. In representation of their veteran members, the Evanston Police Color Guard will also participate in these ceremonies. I also wanted to make a quick announcement about the Christmas tree lighting ceremony, which will be taking place on November 23rd. I know we have a meeting on November 22nd, but this is, uh, we want to get this information out a little bit earlier. This ceremony will kick off uh, at 5.30 on November uh, 23rd at Fountain Square. There will be an outdoor performance of holiday carols by the Music Institute of Chicago Youth Choir and visits from Evanston Mayor Elizabeth Tisdell and Rotary, Rotary International's Associate General Secretary Kathy Kucinich and Santa Claus who will arrive at the festivities by an Evanston fire truck. Immediately following the ceremony is a festive warm-up reception with holiday goodies hosted by Rotary International in their Cafe International in one Rotary Center across from Fountain Square at 1560 Sherman Avenue. Donations of warm essentials including socks, gloves, hats, etc will be collected during the event and then distributed to Hilda's Place, which provides emergency housing and support services for the homeless. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaynor. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Yvonne Thomas, our, our director of the Evanston Health Department, to uh, come up and uh, really share some very exciting news with you uh, regarding next steps as we uh, look to form a federally qualified health center here in Evanston. Ms. Thomas, Thank good you, evening. City Manager. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members, City Manager, and our Evanston community members. Several months ago, the Council instructed the Health Department to pursue a clear strategy to replace the medical services that were lost in the City's medical clinics when we closed in 2007. The Council voted to support our efforts to partner with a federally qualified health center to bring comprehensive medical and dental services for our residents. As you know, a federally qualified health center specializes in providing services to those in need. The health department has spent the last several months interviewing federally qualified health centers in the Chicagoland area, reviewing their financial health, examining the quality of care that each provided, and talking to knowledgeable members of each respected community to dig deeper in the organizations that we could partner with and to learn about their leaders and their culture and to assure a good match for the city. Time and time again, one organization impressed us above and beyond the others. That organization is Erie Family Health Center. Evanston is a wonderful community. We all know that. And we know that this community has strong community spirit that supports citywide efforts um, as our new clinic. We are risk takers, we are visionaries, and we are ready to do the hard work needed to make this project a success. Already many members of the community have stepped forward to offer their support. Evanston is a unique city that is willing to take on challenging projects like this clinic and be a steadfast partner. So to meet the goal of the restoring lost medical services, we have met with our hospital partners, family foundations, philanthropy philanthropy groups, elected officials, community health providers. And we traveled and learned much. We learned uh, from our other partners who have done this initiative before. We've traveled to Lake County, Cook County, and DuPage County. And we had many organizations that wanted to work with the health department. But our selection process led us to Erie Family Health Center. Erie was our first choice to work with the Department of Health and the whole city of Evanston in returning services to our community. They have accepted our invitation. And today, I would like to offer them a chance to introduce themselves to you. I'm delighted to present Erie Family Health Center. Dr. Lee Francis, who's the president and CEO of Erie Family Health Center, would you please stand? Thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Lee Francis to 
um, go over to the podium and he will present Erie Family Health Center to you and introduce his team. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Good, e good evening, everybody. Uh, we are thrilled to be chosen by the City of Evanston Health Department for this project, and we are excited to be your partners for improving the health and wellness of your community. We've already had several meetings with the mayor, uh, with the hospitals in the city, and with various other uh, groups in the city. And tonight, I would like to share with you a little bit about our history and the services that we provide. And I will also set, uh, share with you some initial plans for the health center in Evanston. Erie Family Health Center has over a 50-year history serving those most in need on the west and northwest sides of Chicago, most recently extending to the north side. We started in 1957 with volunteers from Northwestern Memorial Hospital. And in 1970, we became a nonprofit community health center. In 1983, one of the first federally qualified health centers in the state of Illinois. You might be wondering, why is it called Erie Family Health Center? It has nothing to do with the city of Erie in Pennsylvania or the lake named Erie, uh, but it did start on Erie Street, which was a center, a gateway for immigrants on the west side of Chicago in the 1950s. At Erie Family Health, we believe that health care is a right, not a privilege, and our mission is to, to provide accessible, affordable, and high-quality health care for those most in need. Our tagline says, Trust, Heal, Care. And whenever I have two minutes on an elevator to explain what we do, I say we trust, we heal, we care. It's hard to disagree with that. I'd like to introduce two of the stars of our management team who are here with us tonight. I'd like to ask Ileana Mora to stand. She is our Senior Vice President of Strategy and Business Operations, who's been working closely with the city. And Dr. David Buchanan, our Chief Medical Officer, Class of 1988, Evanston Township High School. <laughs> and uh, both Ileana and David will be available in the foyer for questions afterwards. We know the health problems of Evanston. We've studied them. We know about sexually transmitted infections. We know about teen pregnancy. We know that the array of services that we provide will more than cover the needs of Evanston. Last year, we received four awards for excellence in community health care. We received the Oral Health Champion Award from the National Network of Oral Health. We received the Lumity Technology Award for the implementation of our electronic health record. And we received the Axelson Axelson Award for Nonprofit Management from North Park University. And we are fully accredited by the Joint Commission, which accredits, accredits ambulatory facilities and hospitals nationwide. Our patients are as diverse as the community of Evanston. Our doors are open to all, regardless of their ability to pay. Our services are arrayed across the west and northwest side of Chicago, and so an extension into Evanston is a natural progression. Some have said that Evanston is maybe, in some ways, like a small Chicago, but I say, in many ways, Chicago is like a small, Evans a large Evanston. Now let me cover a bit about our specific plans for our effort here in Evanston. This slide summarizes that the health center, and we say health center rather than clinic because of the comprehensive nature of the services, it will be located in the city of Evanston. We'll work closely with hospital partners at North Shore Evanston Hospital and Resurrection St. Francis Hospital. It will be a civic partnership with the city of Evanston we project to care for 4,000 new patients through over 13 to 15,000 new patient visits by the end of the second year of operations. In about 10 days, we will submit a federal grant application to help sustain the health center in Evanston. 
If the grant award is received, we will move full speed ahead. If the grant award is not received, you should know that we are here to stay and we will do everything possible to um, plan for the startup of this health facility without a federal grant. One of the added benefits is that we positively impact upon health, but we also contribute to the economy through many ways, through not only jobs, but also uh, through the services that we purchase in the city of Evanston. Overall, we're very excited about this opportunity. We think we are a great match for the city of Evanston. We think that there will be many, many years of expanding services in Evanston, providing new services, and improving the health of the community in which we all think is one of the gems of Illinois. Thank you very much. To sort of conclude this uh, the presentation, uh, as uh, the doctor mentioned, we are working uh, to uh, get that application in for the initial uh, funding uh, for the FQHC. Um, you'll hear in a little while of our intergovernmental relations report. Uh, we'll be working once that application is submitted in Washington to make sure that we receive it. So, uh, next up, I'm sorry. I just wanted to simply say how exciting this is after three years, almost four years of just waiting to see how we were going to be able to once again provide um, services for here in the community. So I, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm very excited about this. Me too. Alderman Grover? As am I. <laughs> very much so. Thank you very much. And, um, and thank you, Director Thomas, for all you've done to bring this together, to make it happen. And let's cross our fingers about the federal grant. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, two additional items under my announcements. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Sabina Mora, who is our ICMA fellow, uh, to come up and uh, make an announcement regarding uh, the Human Relations Commission uh, town hall meeting that's happening on Saturday. Thank you, City Manager. Um, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, um, I'm here on behalf of the Human Relations Commission uh, to announce the community forum occur occurring this Saturday at 9.30 a.m. at the Levy Center in the Linden Room. Um, the purpose of the community forum is to get community input into the Human Relations Commission 2011-2012 uh, work plan. Uh, the purpose of the Human Relations Commission is to celebrate community and diversity citywide and to promote the inclusion of all Evanston residents. We invite the members of the City Council uh, to attend and all the residents um, of Evanston as well. Thank you very much. And one last announcement, uh, Suzette Robinson, our Director of Public Works, would like to make an introduction of a new staff member. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council. I am pleased, very pleased to announce that we have a new Superintendent of Streets and Sanitation. So Mr. Patrick Sheeran is here and will say a few things, a few words of introduction. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Pat Sheeran. I'm proud and excited to be joining the City of Evanston staff, serving the uh, residents and uh, business owners of the City of Evanston. I uh, come from uh, the uh, Village of Libertyville after serving for 23 years in their Public Works Department, and I look forward to uh, serving the residents of the City of Evanston uh, in the years to come. Thank you. Welcome. That concludes our announcements. City Clerk, do you have communications? Uh, next is a special order of business. Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, we have four items uh, for you this evening. Uh, several of them deal with Council goals, and then uh, we'll make a, a presentation overview of the uh, capital improvement program proposed for uh, FY 2011. But we'll first start with a report on our intergovernmental relations efforts. As you know, Matt Swinkowski uh, is our intergovernmental relations coordinator, is here this evening to provide a brief report, and he's accompanied by Dustin McDonald. Dustin uh, works with uh, our federal lobbyists, uh, 
Holland and Knight in Washington, D.C., and Dustin is here from Washington uh, this evening to uh, give an update specifically uh, on his firm's efforts on our behalf in Washington, D.C. But we'll start first with Mr. Swinkowski. Thank you, Student Manager Bobakwitz. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Alderman, thank you very much. Just want to give you a kind of a brief update on where we're going. Um, this is presentation is based on the presentation I gave to you in July. So you'll see many of the goals, and I'm just going to give you an update. Um, I want to start with some of the first things that um, we shot for and we definitely did not get. Um, first was our Sustainable Communities Initiative. We did a very strong application, as of many of you were well aware. Um, we put together a uh, project for Emerson Square. Um, it was actually a $2 million project, but in terms of where it was funded from, we only had a pot of $40 million for the entire country. Um, met with Congresswoman Schakowsky, met with Senator Durbin, put a strong application forward, but we did not get it. Um, but this type of funding is going to be ongoing. Um, this was the first time it was actually offered, so we're going to be moving forward with new projects in the same type of funding mechanism. Um, second, Tiger II project. We put together a project for um, Dem Dempster Dodge area. Um, a $600 million pot of money seems like a lot of money, but when you think it's for the entire country and there was over a thousand construction grant applications for that allocated up to nineteen billion dollars of money for only six hundred dollars worth or six hundred million dollars worth of projects um, we didn't get it but what what this taught us was you know we're on the scene the right track we need a little bit more innovation on our projects and moving forward and we're going to develop that as well um, and the last thing I want to talk about was, you know, our, our safe route to school, our ITEP grants. Um, we didn't get them um, from the state level. And, you know, on all three of these grants, we need to keep in mind there's a couple of factors in play here that are very important to talk about. One, economic downturn. A lot of communities are turning towards state and federal grants, so there's uh, more people applying for a smaller pot of money. One thing, and you got to always remember that there's, you know, in some respects, some politics in play and what how grants get allocated as well so that's just kind of um, where we're up to date on some of the things we didn't um, get moving forward we have a lot of great um, projects on the horizon and some things we're actively working for um, one is we're looking to go after some um, public works dollars um, when Congress reconvenes they're looking together to put together a major highway funding bill now, this hasn't been done since 2004, and we're still looking for a funding mechanism for them, but we're going to still be going after our Emerson, or our, excuse me, our um, Emerson Street project, looking to get um, Congress approval in 2011. Um, moving forward, um, just to give you a quick update, we also talked about going after a SAFER grant, which is a firefighter um, staffing grant. What happened was with with the city with the city and the unions getting together and reaching a compromise we actually as a city lost standing in the grant application we moved from a tier one they really they really geared after um, communities that had laid off firefighters but once we reached an agreement we actually became less of a community that could apply for this grant so we chose that we shouldn't um, use city uh, resources to go after such a such a grant another um, reason why we didn't apply was that after a couple of years we would have had to um, ongoing funding um, considerations so that's why uh, we did not apply for a safer grant um, and another goal we're still working on is going after some planning money for the water utility um, looking for expansion dollars as well um, and we're applied we're going to be applying for a word of grant in 2011 um, another exciting opportunity which uh, the council um, uh, wanted to fund was going after some youth employment um, we are right now currently looking at putting together a youth build grant um, opportunity for the city of Evanston right now we're working with multiple partners we're trying to get something together by um, fiscal year 2010 might be put into fiscal year 11 just depending on how much we can get done but it's an exciting opportunity for the city to go after um, the age group of 16 to 24 um, youths and trying to give them um, skills that they can use. And also there's education components as well, um, getting um, those students who haven't achieved a GED 
um, and education as well. Um, we're still exploring, um, ex becoming a federal weed and seed community, and as um, we'll talk about in a little bit, there's gonna be some changes to this program. It's gonna be rolled into the Burn um, Justice Grant. And so the funding mechanism and the funding resources are gonna change in fiscal year 11. So that's why we haven't um, necessarily moved forward on that as of today, but it's still on our horizon. We're still going to apply. We just need to know exactly what, how it's gonna take shape in fiscal year uh, 2011. Also exciting, um, which um, Director uh, Thomas talked about tonight, about the FQHC. So we're gonna be working in concert um, to see how we can lobby for some capital funds to help both the build out here in, in the Civic Center and then moving forward to see what um, other facilities we can uh, get funding for um, in fiscal year 2011. So that we're gonna be working in concert, especially with the federal grant that's gonna be applied for right now. Um, I've been working with um, working with staff at the congressional level, the Senate level, and the state level to get letters of support for our grant application moving forward. Um, just move on some state priority updates. Um, obviously, police and fire pension reform in Springfield is a top priority for the council. Um, I think we have done a very good job um, contacting our legislators, making sure the staff understands how it affects us as a community, um, and what I'm gonna talk about in a little bit is how we move forward. How do we educate um, the, the uh, residents of Evanston and how do we activate them a little bit more? And I'm gonna talk about some um, efforts I'm going to be doing in our new Intergovernmental Affairs website. Um, you know, also we're, we're doing some extensive research on an Evanston wet lab, maybe doing a state or a federal earmark on that. Um, so I'm going to be, we're still doing some research and I'll definitely get back to the council on, on the, the results of our, of our research. Um, moving forward, it's going to be a very difficult budget year. As everyone knows, there's a, about a 13 to $15 billion budget deficit in the state of Illinois and we're going to be having to protect the revenue stream that's already coming from the um, state um, and so we're going to have to protect that. Um, Governor Quinn announced uh, about a year and a half ago that he was looking to cut the local government distributive fund. So we're gonna be very vigilant to make sure that that doesn't happen in the upcoming budget year. Um, also moving forward, I'm gonna try to, I'm going to make sure that the council is updated um, probably on a biweekly basis of both federal and state um, legislation that's coming before um, to even update you more as, as things move a little bit faster um, just some regional goals um, that we've talked about um, and some of the regional partnerships I presented to you that we needed to develop um, moving forward. Um, RTA, you know, we've worked with them on, on some, you know, they're the umbrella agency for the Chicago Transit Authority, Metro and Pace. We've built pretty good, strong relationships with them to advocate on the city's behalf for Purple Line infrastructure funds. Um, with the CTA, as well, we're, we're working towards securing some funds for um, Evanston Viaducts. Um, we're, it's still in the early stages, but I know Alderman, Alderman Wind and Alderman Grover and I are gonna go down to CTA on Wednesday morning and advocate on the city's behalf for, those, for some funds. Um, Metra and Union Pacific. I can't emphasize enough how exciting it was and how powerful um, the city of Evanston was three months ago when there were significant cuts proposed to the stops during the rush hour period and how great it was that we activated the council, the mayor, and the citizens to make a positive change. Um, and we got those, those stops, or those cuts in service stopped. And that's something that we need to do uh, ongoing, not always on that side, but also moving forward to uh, on the positive side. So another goal we're, we're working on is making sure we can get the Evanston's viaducts um, rebuilt moving forward. CMAP, I think we've done an excellent job on building a good relationship. They've done support letters for us. Um, we are working then towards getting additional funding because how some federal and state funds work is they get distributed to CMAP, then they distribute it to the municipalities. So we'll be working on garnering some of those funds as well. What's CMAP? 
oh, excuse me, Chicago Metropolitan Authority for Planning, Agency for Planning. Um, it's the regional planning uh, authority for Chicago metropolitan area. Um, our partners in Congress and General Assembly, um, I've been working with staff to get letters of support on various grant proposals um, and getting them to lobby um, whatever agents they knew on, need to on behalf of the city. Um, we've built some very strong, I've built very strong relationships with our staff. We've built very strong relationships, um, meeting with Congresswoman Schakowsky and grant projects, Senator Durbin as well. Um, Northwest Municipal Conference and IML, again, we've really moved forward on pension um, reform legislation, making sure our position is well known to those in Springfield, and it's, it's, it's been very positive. So we're moving forward. We expect a, a proposal to come up in veto session next week. I know um, Mayor Tisdall and uh, City Manager Bobakowitz are, are going to be attending down in, in veto session to make sure that um, our elected officials understand um, how that necessary that reform is to the city. Um, and then last, um, PACE. Um, you know, their arterial rapid transit basically from Davis Street all the way out to um, O'Hare seems to be on, on schedule for 2012. And then we're also going to be, we, we're talking with them about how, we, how do we better integrate PACE and CTA bus service for the city. We're very much blessed with great transportation in the city. And how do we better integrate it for, so people can get to jobs, get to the community functions, get to the centers? So working on that as well. And then basically moving forward, I just want to talk about a couple of great initiatives that I've been uh, I'm trying to get together. One is our website, um, putting together an intergovernmental affairs website to do a couple of things. It's to both educate the residents of the city of Evanston on how policy at the state, federal, and regional level affect their daily lives. But then it's to move beyond just the education. It's to make everyone in the city an advocate for the city. Obviously, people love Evanston. They come to Evanston. They work. But it's also becoming a grassroots advocacy side um, to make sure that those policies benefit the city. Um, this website's going to have a uh, sign-up to be an Evanston advocate. I'm going to keep people who sign up um, educated on what's going on. There's going to be a news link section. Um, there's going to be um, whatever policy matter comes up of the day, keeping it updated um, so that everyone knows what's happening at all those different levels and so that we can move forward with them. Um, um, also, there's going to be sections on uh, allowing citizens to um, sign letters of support um, to con how to contact their both state, regional, federal legislators, um, how to contact Metro if they have a problem, how to contact CTA. So it's going to be an exciting initiative. And actually, when we did the research on it, I've done this in the past for, um, um, for in a prior job. We actually didn't find any other city that actually pr actively promotes their citizens and residents to be advocates. Um, so I think it's somewhat new and cutting edge in that way. Um, you know, going forward, also we're putting together, and Dustin's going to talk about this a lot, getting a grants calendar so we, we know we can start to plan ahead of time. You know, we have a great talented um, employees and city council, but looking out not just three months ahead of time on grants, but looking 10, 12, 15 months ahead and getting a calendar set so we can start to propose innovative projects that are going to meet with what the federal government and the state government's really looking for. So putting together a calendar that looks a year ahead as opposed to a few months ahead. Um, obviously, keeping up our regional relationships, ongoing monthly reports. We're also uh, collecting projects from uh, department heads for appropriation projects that can be submitted in 2011. Um, we're going to be uh, proposing our Evanston. We're going to be doing another Evanston Day. Looks like at the end of March, March 30th. Um, which was very successful last year. It was actually my first day on the job um, and looking to improve upon that um, in 2011. And then really being innovative. Um, one thing I've learned in the past six months is, you know, we need to move forward on some really innovative projects that meet federal criteria for grant funding and, and really harnessing the talent that we have here and really kind of thinking a little bit outside the box on how do we really attack um, these federal grant opportunities, these appropriation opportunities, 
and how do we really fit in a little bit better? And I think uh, um, our partners at Holland and Knight and can really help us kind of get that innovative thinking. So I'm going to turn it over briefly to Dustin to uh, be able to give a little presentation and then answer questions as well. Thank you, Matt, and Madam Mayor, City Manager Bobkowitz, and Alderman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight to speak to you and talk to you a little bit about what Holland and Knight has been doing in working with your Intergovernmental Affairs Director, um, as well as your city staff and various department heads in trying to move forward with identifying and pursuing, pursuing federal grant opportunities and funding opportunities at large that are presented at the federal level. Um, we began working with the city in May and June of this year, and in June particularly, initiated our federal strategy effort by holding a, a series of meetings with all of the city department heads to discuss what each one of their priorities were, um, their priority list at large by department, and then subsequent to that effort, moving forward with uh, a citywide effort to identify all of the various priorities that the city was trying to move by department and then with the city at large. And from that effort, we then sought to work with the city department heads and the intergovernmental affairs staff to try to identify federal resources that match with those priorities. And in addition to identifying and matching those priorities, try to figure out what support system we had to build in order to be successful in approaching these federal opportunities. That has comprised the, the bulk of the work that we've we've done so far. While it sounds uh, mundane or, or preparatory, it, it certainly has been lengthy um, and it's it's been required, but it's, it's certainly been useful. Um, and it's positioned us to apply for a number of federal funding opportunities um, that I don't feel the city was prepared for to apply for in the past. Um, just to date, I know Matt has handed you a packet of, of information that not only includes his presentation, but also outlines the, some current grant opportunities that we're pursuing um, right now, as well as uh, the, the second or the, or the last packet you have there uh, lists a number of FY11 grant opportunities that are going to be coming up. And I think what's been significant so far from our efforts as well as moving into next year is that a, a number of these grant opportunities were, were new grant opportunities that the administration was moving out. For example, the Sustainable Communities Initiative. As Matt mentioned, there, there wasn't a significant amount of funding for this, but this is an administration priority that spans across multiple agencies covering uh, the Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development, Department of Transportation, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, the administration has done something innovative here in trying to merge the priorities of these departments um, to reach a number of goals covering uh, climate protection and greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, sustainable planning, um, so that uh, transit and um, affordable housing are linked and uh, there's increased access to affordable housing and transportation. As they've done this, they've tried to move forward a series of, of federal funding options so that local governments that don't have the resources to try to uh, move forward with, the, with meeting some of these goals on their own have uh, some federal resources to draw from. We've been aggressive in working with these agencies to identify the parameters of these various grant opportunities and then working with your departments and, and staff and intergovernmental affairs director to try to put together the best possible packages we can um, in trying to secure this funding. Um, I think what we've learned is a great deal about what capabilities we have and um, what, what we still need to marshal to move forward. Um, but having that understanding and that foundation has put us in a great position to not only move forward on these grant opportunities, but also to pursue other opportunities in annual appropriations legislation, congressionally directed spending, and earmarks is, I'm sure, a subject that we'll want to talk about here tonight, um, as well as regulatory opportunities that the administration is opening to uh, enable us to move forward on some larger objectives, uh, such as um, water infrastructure and, and the city's goals in that arena. Um, that's really the short presentation I prepared. I've anticipated a number of questions, so um, please feel free. That's perfect, because we're going to take a short uh, <laughs> time out now. So OK. Go. <laughs> oh, well.
Oh, okay. We have a microphone. Would Dale Mortensen please come up and Beverly? has been described by all of his neighbors as a quiet, steady kind of guy, a family man, never creates a big stir or a big fuss. <laughs> Certainly blown that image out of the water. <laughs> so I am going to read, because I do not have this memorized, Dale T. Mortensen is the Ida C. Cook Professor of Economics at Northwestern University the Niels Bohr Visiting Professor of Economics at Erhaus University, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a research fellow of the Institute for the Study of Labor. Professor Mortensen received his BA in economics from Willamette University in 1961 and his PhD in economics from Carnegie Mellon University in 1967. Mortensen is a fellow of Econometrica Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Society of Labor Economics, and the European Economic Association. He was awarded the IZA Labor Economics Prize in 2005 and the Society of Labor Economics Mincer Prize in 2007. In 2008, he was elected an American Economic Association Distinguished Fellow, and I'd like to mention that he also sings in the choir. <laughs> he does. Mortensen pioneered the theory of job search and search on employment and extended it to study labor turnover, research and development, personal relationships, and labor reallocation. His insight that friction is equivalent to the random arrival of trading partners, don't tell me if I got that wrong, <laughs> has become the leading technique for an analysis of labor markets and the effects of labor market policy. The development of equilibrium dynamic models designed to account for wage dispersion, the time series behavior of job and worker flows, and the role of reallocation in the determination of aggregate growth and productivity are the principal topics of his current research. His publications include over 50 scientific articles. His book, Wage Dispersions, Why Are Similar Workers Paid Differently, was published by MIT Press in 2003. And, did I mention, he won the Nobel Prize for <laughs> Evanston community, I would like to present you with the key to the city. Uh -oh. <laughs> And Beverly, on behalf of the Evanston City Council and the entire Evanston community, I would like to present you with these flowers. And now we have, to, for all of us to celebrate this event, because it's an event for all of Evanston, the largest cake that I think has ever graced City Council. And we are going to adjourn and eat it. You are all welcome. Well, thank you very much. This is a great honor. Uh, I seem to be accumulating them lately. Uh, but uh, being a longtime resident, over 45 years now of Evanston, I appreciate uh, my neighbor's uh, acclamation. Thank you. Thank you.
just going to say we've been here a long time and it's really lovely to be here and we're very grateful that you think this is fun. <laughs> we do too, so thank you. <laughs> problem. But I hope you had some cake. Um, Alderman Jean-Baptiste, did you have a question? I did. I wanted to know uh, from the gentleman um, what he predicts will be the impact of this um, shift in, in Congress on municipalities such as ours' ability to, to get some of these funds. I think the, the impact you're looking at is uh, what, we're, uh, what, we're, what we're somewhat small pots to begin with in terms of funding opportunities will be smaller. Um, $600 million for the entire nation um, for, for large transportation infrastructure projects that aren't being funded through an authorization bill because Congress has stalled on them. That $600 million will, will certainly be less in FY12. Um, you're looking at those types of pots decreasing in size. The administration is going to be put in a position where it has to make compromises with uh, 
pretty large Republican House majority um, that will be seeking to dramatically decrease federal spending, and they'll look to cut wherever possible, and the administration is certainly going to have to make some tough choices in working with um, the Republican House um, uh, and, and support from its, from its Democratic senators to, to organize a budget um, that, that meets those goals. I think in the, in the short term, in FY 2011, when Congress returns for its post-election session, you're going to see um, Congress's chief goal is trying to finish its FY 11 appropriations work. Mm -hmm. And as part of that work, um, they'll probably decrease the total amount of funding they had as an aggregate in those 12 appropriations bills um, to a smaller number, probably to the, the bottom line number that they initially began with um, when they went into it. But um, on, uh, on the whole, you're, you're looking at probably uh, fewer, fewer resources being available to local governments um, and kind of anticipating that this direction was emerging, our firm began discussions earlier this spring with uh, some of the uh, government watchdog groups like Taxpayers for Common Sense uh, to sit down and talk about ways that we could still move forward with projects that are uh, project funding that's largely directed to local governments, whether that be in the form of appropriations, earmarks, and congressionally directed spending or the same type of funding directed through <coughs> authorization bills like the five-year transportation reauthorization bill that Matt alluded to, uh, Safety Lou or Water Resources Development Act. All that funding is traditionally um, earmarked uh, for various municipal projects across the country by Congress. Um, and we've, we've been working with uh, a lot of the government watchdog groups uh, as well as um, incoming Republican leadership in the House to talk to them about ways that we can still move forward with those types of projects while uh, simultaneously finding agreement on, on uh, their priority to eliminate earmarks. Thank you. Alderman Grover. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. McDonough, we've um, invested in the federal lobbying services of Holland and Knight, and while there's been no yet tangible product, um, is there a timeline for how these things unfold and when we start realizing the fruits of our investment? Thank you. I think the answer to your question is twofold. In terms of, uh, I guess, what has traditionally been viewed as uh, available funding resources for local government projects that the federal government uh, provides, I think the, the first piece of that is the appropriations and authorization um, funding resources, so earmarks in, in those types of bills. Um, I think for, for, for those types of bills, uh, the timeline is, is a, lot, a lot less predictable because ultimately it depends on the expedience of, expediency of Congress, and I think Congress has done a pretty good job of demonstrating that they're not very expedient at doing much. Um, so in terms of safety reauthor reauthorization, for instance, um, that bill has languished for, for over a year now, and it's certainly a priority, finally, of the administration and definitely of the incoming Congress to move forward with that bill and, and the funding associated for local infrastructure projects. Um, but you probably won't see um, a bill like that get done probably till the end of next year with funding associated with that bill rolling out the following spring. Now, in terms of um, grant opportunities, they have a much more defined timeline that, that we can identify. Um, and as Congress has been less efficient in moving forward, the first piece that I mentioned, um, you know, we've organized, that's why we've organized a real comprehensive strategy so we could kind of pursue each funding in each one of these areas simultaneously so that if there wasn't earmark funding moving forward, we could also simultaneously pursue the grant funding. On the grant side, um, as you'll see in the, in the packets that we presented to you there, there are a number of funding opportunities available um, on the grant side covering multiple agencies, um, Health and Human Services, uh, HUD, DOT, uh, EPA, EDA, um, and, we're, and we work with, with Matt and, and, and your staff to really try to match those grant opportunities up with these different funding categories available at the federal level so that we can advance them on a more um, uh, predictable timeline. Grants come, grants are announced by an agency with a defined deadline of, uh, of when those grant announcements will be made and uh, 
subsequently uh, awards will be made. So I think as far as, as far as the grant side, as we'll begin applying to, there's some FY10 grants that we're still applying to that we'll, we'll see results on within the next couple of months. Um, as far as the FY11 uh, funding objectives, um, a number of those grants will be brand new grants for the agencies that are administering them and they'll have to develop regulations before they can announce the opportunity to apply. But some of them are grants that we took a first shot at this year um, and while we weren't successful on them, um, we've, we've learned a lot about how to move forward successfully on them in the next round. Most of those grants were new grants for, for the agencies administering them as well. So um, it's been a learning curve for both sides. But for those grant opportunities, you'll probably see announcements for those grant opportunities in the spring of next year with awards um, uh, coming out in the fall or, or in, in the winter of, of next year. The other piece I feel like I should mention is, is uh, the administration regulatory side. Um, that's been an area that we've kind of moved into to uh, open up another channel for the city to, to pursue federal funding. Uh, for example, um, the Envi Environmental Protection Agency has uh, just last month organized a new draft policy um, where they would like to, they recognize that there's a limited amount of resources they can provide to local governments uh, for uh, water infrastructure improvement projects. Um, the main funding resources are the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, and they are loan funds at either low or no interest, um, but those are the primary resources the federal government uses to, to finance these types of projects. What EPA is doing now is recognizing that those are the only two funding streams, um, working with local governments who have um, innovative concepts in providing uh, water sustainably as well as in doing so reducing uh, the cost of providing providing clean water and drinking water, um, working with them uh, to, uh, to kind of harness those available funding streams and direct them to those projects where they can be of most benefit. Um, so we're, we're looking at regulatory opportunities as well in addition to the appropriations and authorization and grant funding pieces. Madam Mayor, unless there's other questions from the Council, uh, we just wanted to uh, provide this update. Um, uh, opportunity to have Mr. McDonald here from Washington, so I want to thank him for, for making the trip. And really want to uh, commend Matt. Uh, this is a brand new position. Uh, he's been able to come and really hit the ground running. We've been saying, talking a lot about the state and federal government, but the, really the impacts that we've had uh, regionally with the CTA, the RTA, Metra, PACE, uh, Matt and I went and met with the executive director of PACE, and the first words out of his mouth was he had never, they had never seen Evanston City officials at their headquarters. Uh, and this was a gentleman with 30 years of experience working at PACE. So uh, I think we've made some real progress uh, overall, but certainly regionally I want to commend Matt for his good work and, and again thank Dustin for coming out. And we'll, We've committed to come to the council every six months, and so we'll be back uh, um, next spring with a, a further update. So thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, along those lines, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, our next presentation um, is a, a, a new staff member who the Council has not yet formally met, and that's Devon Woodard. Uh, Devon uh, holds a new position with us, and that is a development officer. Um, basically, it's Devon's job to raise non-tax revenue for the City of Evanston. Uh, Devon comes to us uh, uh, with experience working not only in the nonprofit sector as a development uh, a person, but uh, also uh, having worked for the Chicago Park District, uh, doing similar type work. Uh, I've asked Devon to come tonight to not only to introduce himself, but also to give an overview of his work plan uh, for the coming year, uh, to talk about the areas of focus that he'll be, uh, be working on and to answer your questions. Devon, good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, Tisdale, Council Members, uh, Manager Bob Kowitz, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you this evening. As you know, the development officer position is new within the city, and my goal tonight is to provide you with an overview of fundraising as a whole, as well as how my role fits into the city, and most importantly, the goals and priorities that I have for the, the fiscal year. And we will start with an overview of fundraising. All right. Traditional fundraising can be divided into four uh, separate revenue streams, each with its own funding priorities and giving mechanisms. Uh, the most well-known would be uh, individual giving, particularly annual giving, which are the year-end appeals that you receive from organizations such as the Red Cross uh, or the United Way. 
Um, there's also major donors, planned giving, special events. Uh, the second area is uh, support from the federal and state governments, and that tends to be provided through program and service grants, uh, most recently through the American uh, Reinvestment and Recovery Act, the NSP2 project that we uh, were awarded a few uh, months ago. Uh, foundations uh, give through four giving uh, organizations, community foundations, such as the Evanston Community Foundation, private foundations, family foundations, and corporate foundations. Uh, corporate foundations are a hybrid uh, organization, uh, which is why they're listed twice uh, on this list. Uh, this is because corporate foundations can operate either from a one-time endowment from a corporation, such as the Ford Foundation, or receive a percentage of the annual corporate revenue, uh, such as Sarah Lee. Um, and then the final source of revenue is actually corporate marketing revenue. Uh, this tends to be distributed through sponsorships and advertising opportunities, and because these are not philanthropic dollars, the focus of this revenue is on increasing visibility within target audiences, improving corporate image within a community, and engaging consumers in the brand experience. Uh, and while visibility components of this partnership are generally tied to a specific program, the revenue is general operating. Uh, and as we review these uh, funding streams, the city is actually familiar with a lot of uh, a lot of these funding streams, uh, particularly the Library Fund for Excellence um, with direct mail appeals, the naming of the Robert Crown Center uh, as a major donor, uh, the NSP2 as a government support, and then sponsorships within the Lakeshore Arts and Ethnic Arts Festivals. And while some departments um, have been able to leverage internal resources uh, to secure these um, these external funding, it is not consistent across the city. Each department has its own uh, sources and internal structure. Uh, some have people who dedicate time to looking at outside of the, the city. Some don't. Some have groups working um, to leverage uh, external resources. Um, and that's kind of where I come in, is to level that playing field across um, all the city departments and bringing in, I'm oh, sorry, and bringing in my experience in particularly corporate sponsorships, individual giving, proposal writing on both the foundation and government side to really work with departments to assess where, what uh, their needs are um, for any particular uh, funding revenue, but also to uh, look at the council priorities, the city budget, the capital improvement plan, um, and leverage those with city assets and really bring in the regional and national funders from the corporate side um, to leverage those assets. Um, after uh, discussing preliminary infrastructure needs and funding priorities, uh, I see three goals that really emerge for my area. And the first is to coordinate an internal proposal and sponsorship solicitation process for all the departments. Uh, identify new streams of non-tax revenue from corporate sponsorships, corporate advertising, foundation and government sources, and increase individual charitable gifts to support programs and initiatives. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, from these goals, two levels of priorities kind of emerge. The first are citywide priorities, and the second are departmental specific priorities. With regard to uh, citywide priorities, the first one is the implementation of the partnership coordination system. Using an electronic intent to apply process will streamline the submission process. Um, that will be used by um, all departments and keeping each other informed of uh, interest in applying for external funding, um, identifying existing relationships and leveraging, leveraging those relationships uh, for the best of the city. Um, in the past, what has happened is that with each department working independently to secure funding, the city has at times competed with itself and the same funder and the same funding cycle without knowing it. Um, so that puts us at a disadvantage um, in the long term. But by implementing an you know, internal uh, partnership system, uh, this process will likely impact, uh, increase the likelihood of funding, strengthen and strengthen the city's relationship uh, with funders over the long term. And so as, as more funders are engaged, it is crucial that the city is coordinated and consistent with respect to funder identification, solicitation, and partnership execution so that we can achieve and maintain the gold standard in all of our partnerships with funders.
the second citywide priority is the implementation of the corporate marketing program. Sponsorships and advertising provide opportunities for corporations to reach new customers and more fully engage existing customers in their consumer brand. The national economy will never return to 1998 or even 2006 levels, and as such, municipalities are faced with the dilemma of how to sustain and improve programs in this new reality. Over the last 15 years, many cities have begun thinking strategically and outside of the box to secure additional revenue, and public-private partnerships have become more common. Among the national leaders in municipal corporate uh, programs include San Diego, California, and New York City. In addition to program-specific partnerships within in San Diego, the, uh, the city has also uh, identified official partners for automatic defibrillators, credit union, uh, wireless provider, and beverage uh, providers. Other municipalities now joining uh, this trend include Costa, Costa Mesa, California, Santa Clara County, California, and the city of San Antonio, Texas. And right now, the Evanston is uniquely situated to join these other cities and take advantage of these partnerships um, because of our diversity within our community, the breadth of potential assets uh, we can leverage, and because we're on the front end of corporate partnerships within the region. And by getting to the table early and consistently, we'll be in a much better position to secure partnerships in the long term. Uh, the Evanston Corporate Partner Program will occur through three channels. The first is the traditional marketing partners program, which will be a comprehensive sponsorship and advertising program, leveraging the physical, human, and uh, social assets from both the city and from our corporate partners. These partnerships uh, will not be static for every partner, but will be a tailored mixture of assets to meet uh, audience and city needs. The second, uh, the with the Hometown Pride Program, Evanston-based Businesses have been and continue to be tremendous partners to the city. The Hometown Pride Program will, is designed to increase the awareness and visibility of the impact that they're having um, in our community. And finally, goods and services. I will begin reviewing the major uh, purchasing RFPs as well as proposing some new ones uh, to identify opportunities where contract evaluation uh, can include not only competitive pricing but also additional partnership uh, benefits for the city and for the corporation. In San Diego, this was done with wireless service provision. Um, some preliminary concepts that are being explored include... Uh, read, uh, sorry. Naming opportunities for the renovated beach houses, cash sponsorships, and in-kind uh, apparel donations for uh, lifeguards and stations, uh, additional sponsorships for the annual Women Out Walking event, um, and underwriting the cost of the new Volunteer Evanston website with uh, rotating sponsorship and advertisement. And a list of potential official city of Evanston partners by industry are on the right-hand side. So in addition to these broad citywide priorities, I have also identified with the department head specific department needs. Um, and as you can see, to meet these needs, um, it's going to need, mean combining resources from multiple sources, including corporate marketing revenue, individuals, uh, foundations, and government support. We are already moving forward on securing revenue for these programs particularly around library services, the summer festival sponsorships, and the FQHC. Um, my next steps uh, within this process are to, to implement the partnership coordination system this month, um, provide, uh, present to the council preliminary policies regarding my work uh, for corporate marketing, advertising, sponsorships, and donations at the December meeting, uh, marketing and advertising the new sponsorship uh, summer festival sponsorship packages, uh, marketing and uh, securing uh, new partners for the federally qualified health center, um, as well as the ongoing uh, identification and submission for foundation and government grants. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Grover. Thank you, Mr. Woodard. I'm glad to meet you. I'm glad you're with us. Um, my question is, I don't know a whole lot about development and marketing, but it seems to be in order to attract a lot of, of these opportunities, we have to have a good brand to begin with. And I'd be interested in your perspective on the strength of the city of Evanston brand. Are we the kind of uh, organization that these potential partners are going to want to do business with? 
Yes, and I think it's because the city of Evanston brand extends throughout the community. Um, this is a community that people really want to get involved with. The citizenry is a very engaged community, and they want that to associate that with their brand. Thank you. I see no further lights, so you did a great job. Thank you. Our next presentation is uh, to uh, give you an update on one of your council goals, and that's the council goal on affordable housing. We've had uh, several changes uh, to our team um, over the last several months uh, dealing with affordable housing issues, and I believe you're going to hear from all of them um, tonight. If not, we'll, we'll, we'll point out the rest. Um, but uh, we're very excited. We, we talk a lot about the NSP2 project, but we have other uh, affordable housing initiatives that we're working on, Sir Flax. Uh, has been kind enough to uh, serve as the, the coordinator, ringmaster of uh, all of these uh, programs for us. So we thank her for that new assignment um, and uh, welcome her this evening and hope that you'll, you'll introduce uh, the full team. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Mayor Tisdall, uh, members of the, city, of the City Council and uh, City Manager. Um, there are four of us here to, tonight, uh, more than four of us here, but who are working on the housing and homeless uh, issues all relating to housing. Um, myself, Sarah Flax, Housing and Grants Administrator. Elisa Dean, uh, here with me, Community Intervention Coordinator. And Mary Ellen Poole, who is our housing planner, new housing planner, been here six whole weeks, I think. Um, and Jolene Saul, Housing Development Specialist for NSP2. Um, few months longer, but also a relatively new hire. Um, so, um, really quickly, um, our update on affordable housing, um, we have three primary goals or areas in which we're working. One is to create additional affordable housing units. Um, we're going to be focusing on rental going forward, um, and we're going to be looking at selective ownership opportunities. Another important part of affordable housing is to maintain existing ownership and rental housing units as affordable units. And third, addressing the needs of the homeless and people at high risk of homelessness. So how are we going to do that? Um, first, who are we talking about? Um, affordable housing. Um, traditionally, our HUD grants, which are our primary sources of housing funds, um, are for households at or below 80% of area median. And I apologize if I speak in HUD speak um, a lot, but what does that mean? Um, for the most part, our federal grants are um, focused on that 80% or less of area median. And for a family of four, 80% um, of area median is about a little over $60,000 in gross income. So that gives you an idea of what 80% of area median is for a family of four. Um, who needs affordable housing? Um, a lot of people. We define somebody as a household as needing help with their housing uh, when they are cost burdened, when they spend over 30% of their housing, of their gross income on housing. Um, when you look at Evanston, 50% of our households are at or below 80% of area median. Um, our cost burden, and when you get to households at 50% or below the area median in income, that rises to 79% of those households. So that is, that's based on the 2000 census. I expect we're going to see some change and some, unfortunately, increases in that with the 2010 census. Okay, so creating affordable housing. Um, we have a unique opportunity with our NSP2 grant. Um, and it will enable us to create a lot more affordable housing than we would otherwise would be able to. But it's also different from our traditional HUD grants in that it is um, a different income target. With NSP2, we can help households with up to 120% of area median income. So instead of looking at households that are making, for a family of four in the neighborhood of $60,000, we can go up to um, a little over 90,000. A family of four currently um, the, at 120 percent of area median income is, uh, has a gross income of 90,100. So NSP2 has a slightly different goal from our um, traditional 
HUD and uh, uh, home and CDBG funds use for affordable housing, and that it is neighborhood stabilization. So we can go to a higher income level, but we can only work in certain areas because we can only work in the areas that were most affected by the housing crisis. That uh, limits us geographically, but it, it expands our income, again, because the goal is stabilization. Um, so we will be developing in, with rental, with our scattered site uh, program, approximately 50 units of scattered site rental in our two census tracts, um, West Evanston, 8092, and South Evanston, 8102. Um, there will be additional um, rental units in Emerson Square. And um, another rental pro uh, project we're looking at right now is a four-unit rental project, which is um, a home project. Um, next steps for rental. Um, obviously implement NSP2, but look at our home um, rental program, uh, our home grant as primarily a source for um, <coughs> rental projects, looking especially outside of our two census tracts that are primarily NSP2. Um, another thing that we plan to do is we plan to evaluate tenant-based rental assistance. Home funds can be used to create a voucher program um, where you provide the subsidy to the household but the unit itself isn't subsidized. And this may offer us an opportunity to develop um, affordable units, virtual units, rapidly, um, and to address uh, the need for housing in the community. Affordable ownership. We know we need to be careful and strategic in creating ownership opportunity, but it's also very um, important. Um, for the most part, when we are looking at ownership, we're going to be looking at between households that are making between 70 and 120 percent of the area median income. NSP2, again, allows us um, the opportunity with which we will be generating 50 units of ownership uh, housing in our scattered site program in our two census tracts and eight more planned in Emerson Square. Um, home funds will be used um, through down payment assistance primarily, also with the Affordable Housing Fund. Home um, funds can be used for down payment for those 80% or less of area median. And that's generally going to be in about the 70 to 80%. We're not going to be going much lower than that um, based on the realities of the market. Affordable Housing Fund allows us to go up to 100% of area median income. Home-funded project-based um, activities we need to consider very selectively um, because with that 80% of area median cap, if you develop a lot of ownership, you may not be able to fill it, and that's something we don't want to do. Um, our focus needs to be on rental. Um, we will look at additional development partners. We've been working primarily with our um, five CHOTOs in past years. Um, HOME requires us to work with CHOTOs. We have to use 15% of our grant with CHOTOs, uh, community housing development organizations. Sorry, I'm getting into how to speak. Um, but we also need to look at other potential partners, including Habitat for Humanity and private development. Affordable rental. We really, in addition to developing affordable rental, we need to ma maintain, oops, what I do here? Okay, maintaining affordable ownership. Let me do the ownership first before I get, um, we do a significant amount of work in Evanston to help existing low and moderate income uh, homeowners maintain their housing. Our CDBG housing rehab program um, in the past year gave out $296,000 in low or zero interest loans to um, income eligible households to improve their households largely in response to code violations or emergency needs. For example, somebody's furnace goes out and they ha do not have the funds to um, replace it or they have a leaking roof. So it improves our, our housing stock as a whole and helps the um, individual homeowners. We used about 250000 of the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant in 2010 to weatherize um, households, uh, homes for households at or below 80% of area median. Um, with ownership, we um, completed rehab on 11 single-family homes. Using that, that's one-time funding, but it's very important. If we weatherize homes, not only are they um, um, more energy efficient, but they reduce the costs for the homeowners in terms of their uh, utilities, which is another major factor in um, the cost of your home. 
We have another technique we use for maintaining uh, affordable home ownership, and that is the home sharing program through um, Interfaith Housing. This is a program that matches a homeowner, somebody who has an extra room in his or her home, with somebody looking for affordable renter, uh, rental space. And frequently, these are people who simply cannot afford market rate rental. Um, home sharing is an innovative and um, very effective means of creating virtual affordable uni units, both as I say for the rental and keeping the um, owners able to maintain their home. The city has been funding foreclosure counseling through interfaith housing. Um, so far, this fiscal, uh, this calendar year, we've uh, worked with uh, interfaith has worked with 30 homeowners. Um, the projection is to work with 45 um, homeowners and attempt to help them with mortgage workarounds with their banks in order to stay in their homes. What other programs are we going to look at? Um, one of the things we're seeing is the problems of condo associations not when you have um, foreclosures in condo associations, it greatly affects the association as a whole. The um, association payments, uh, assessments aren't paid by those unoccupied units, and um, individual owners make that up. Also, reserves tend to be um, spent down. Um, one of the things we're finding with NSP2 is there are condominiums that we're uh, looking at purchasing that are foreclosed, but we have to be careful because if the condominium is in um, shaky enough financial condition, we won't be able to sell those units should we get them because no bank will underwrite them and provide them a loan right now. So that's another interesting challenge. Um, we've talked with HUD. We've tried to see if we can use CDBG, Home, or any other um, sources of revenue to try to help those um, people who are behind in their assessments for the same reasons that other people are um, behind in their mortgage, that they've lost income or any number of other things. So far, we haven't found... Um, any agreed upon um, source of um, funds for that. However, very new release, um, there is a new federal program that's coming through IDA, the Illinois Housing Development As um, Authority, that is called Hardest Hit. And uh, it will be funds for direct assistance. Uh, we don't know all, any details yet. It's brand new, but we'll be watching it very carefully. It may give us the opportunity to um, help some of those people, including in condominiums. Well, that didn't work. Maintaining affordable rental. Um, same tools in many cases. CDBG Housing Rehab uh, can address our rental units, and uh, it's a very important um, source of rehab funds for um, rental housing. One of the differences, we can use CDBG, we can use home. You use different funds under different circumstances because they're looked at differently by HUD. CDBG, when you rehab housing with CDBG, the occupants need to be income qualified at the time the rehab is finished. But there isn't necessarily any long-term affordability. So it gives us an opportunity, say with a owner-occupied three-flat or a two-flat, where you have an income-eligible homeowner, 80% or less of area median, who relies on rental income to increase his or her um, income and, and pay for that property. In those cases, we can help them. They can rent out at market rate, which actually improves their overall economic uh, circumstances as well as providing housing. So CDBG, generally, when you're looking at a, a multifamily building, 51% of the units have to be um, occupied by income-eligible households. Uh, with home, every home unit that you assist must be occupied by an income eligible household and you have um, long term affordability based on the amount of funds invested so some of the differences of those um, again we use weatherization from the energy efficiency and conservation block funds uh, we use that money for weatherization uh, for multifamily 35 units in six buildings um, again that's as I say a one time source of funding but, um, we do however work with um, the state weatherization program try to refer households that are eligible for that totally different income um, guidelines 200% or less of uh, um, the poverty level for that so one of the problems is making sure that you can figure out the relationship between all the different um, income qualifications home recently we've used 
um, particularly to help maintain um, the quality of our special needs housing. Um, Hill Arboretum Apartments, 33 units for um, severely disabled adults in wheelchairs. Uh, that rehab will be finished shortly. Um, we are also uh, providing home funds to Shore Community Services for their SILA, Community Integrated Living Arrangement, which is again for uh, disabled adults. I'm going to turn the microphone over to um, Elisa Dean to talk a bit about our homeless programs. Good evening. Programs for homeless and at high risk of homelessness. President Obama signed into law May of 2009 the Hearth Act. The Hearth Act will consolidate HUD's homeless funding sources and explain HUD's definition of homelessness. This allowing the Continuum of Care members, HMIS administrators, and federal programs to continue to serve many more individual families and veterans. The Continuum of Care um, receives approximately one million from HUD annually. The city is the leading agency and supports 53 permanent supportive housing, 30 family um, transitional housing beds, 32 beds for women and children who are victims of domestic violence, and 20 beds for single adults at Hill's Place. The emergency shelter grant supports shelter operation and services for the homeless. The Hearth Act is revamping the Emergency Shelter Grant Program, renaming it the Emergency Solution Grant Program. This program should provide flexibility to homeless prevention and rapid rehousing demands. The combining of these changes will give local efforts an important tool to confront homelessness. Still, there is a significant unmet need for permanent supportive housing and emergency shelters. Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing, HPRP. HPRP was created to provide services and direct assistance to those qualified individuals that are either at risk of being homeless or are currently homeless. Through this program, we are able to provide assistance in the form of rental, utility payments, moving costs, security deposits, and hotel, motel vouchers. The guidelines, household incomes at or below 50% of the area median income, have no other resources and have the ability to maintain housing after they receive the assistance. Case management, oops, sorry. Case management, budgeting, and credit counseling services are also available to the HPRP recipients. Health to this date, November 2009 through October 2010, uh, HPRP have served 52 households and 19, and rapid rehousing 19 households. Emergency Displaced Program. This program provides three days of shelter in one of the local um, hotels for renters who are displaced by a fire, some sort of natural disaster, or coal violation. Thank you. Um, another one of our other programs um, is the Families in Transition program. Um, families in Transition is a 24-month um, rental subsidy program for families with incomes at or below 40% of the area median income with multiple barriers to independence um, in terms of financial and just other ne uh, needs for support. Um, we always have a sponsor, Social Services Agency, um, and that agency provides intensive case management and other services during that whole period of time with the goal of then the family being able to move into independent 
self-sustaining. Um, rental, in most cases, um, housing, and then also maintaining jobs, all the rest of the things they need to be able to live independently. That's a program that we will continue to evaluate the outcomes on. One of the challenges for all of our programs that are working with families that are struggling is while the economy is as soft as it is and the job market is so poor, there are times that almost no matter what we do working with them, it's very difficult to really lift them into um, uh, independent, um, self-sustaining um, economic situations. Um, we also need to look at ways to expand the capacity for the homeless needs that um, Elisa was just talking about. Homes, CDBG, and emergency shelter grants can all be used to develop either beds or shelters depending on what type of facility it is. You use a different funding stream. But if you develop those programs, you also need to have the supportive services. So that's something where we have to work very closely with the continuum of care. Um, watch the Hearth Act very closely. Um, they're talking about huge changes in the funding stream for all of those needs. What else? Um, as a city, I mentioned uh, through home, most of our um, housing development, both rental and ownership, has been done with our community housing development organizations. Um, most nonprofits working in um, affordable housing have struggled also in this economy as well. Um, we're working with our CHOTOs. Um, on assessing their capacity and their long-term goals. We're also working through HUD to get them technical assistance. Um, there is a special pot of money for technical assistance for CHOTOs that does not come through the city. It comes direct from HUD that we're working on getting them. Um, website improvements. We have a lot of stuff on our website. It isn't always easy to find it. We need to continue to work on improving that. Um, mer merging NSP homes, both rental and ownership, into that as they come online. One of the challenges is we can't think in terms of providing information from grant perspective where the money comes from. It's got to be from the um, need perspective, the person looking for housing. Um, and evaluate effectiveness of our inclusionary, inclusionary housing ordinance and other um, mechanisms that we have to um, try to support affordable housing. Not a whole lot of 24 plus unit plan developments going on right now to either pay in or to develop affordable housing as part of uh, our non-grant funded. So it's something we have to continue to look at. Um, there's a lot more to be said on affordable housing, but I also know there's a very long meeting. <laughs> so is there any questions? Alderman Burris. Um, first, I'd like to say, as always, Sarah, you are amazing. Um, and thank you and your team for all the work you do. Um, it's just uh, amazing how much uh, during this ongoing financial crisis and so many people in need, um, it's uh, really just amazing. Thank you so, so much. Um, I do have a question about the um, home sharing program. Mm -hmm. You said that you've helped 12 people. Um, is that through the interfaith program? And um, why is it only 12? Are, are there not enough people involved in it? It's an amazing program. And I'm wondering if just people don't know about it or... What, if you could talk to um, about that. Actually, it can flush, fluctuate quite a bit. When we're counting the 12, we're counting Evanston matches. Um, and we've gone as high as 24 matches in some years. It, it can vary all over the place. Um, one of the things that happens is sometimes um, people don't know. There's been some good publicity on that. Um, other times, believe it or not, it's even hard to get matches sometimes in home sharing. Sometimes the needs of the people for additional income don't match the needs of the people who are looking for housing. Um, but Interfaith is their 25th uh, year of providing home sharing that was celebrated at their annual meeting. And I think it's something we just need to continue to work at and get better at. Okay, thanks. Alderman Rainey. Very quickly, um, because home sharing with Interfaith is such a fabulous program, um, they have recently received a grant from the Crown Victoria Foundation mm -hmm. to generate more publicity to help them promote and do public relations and investigate, you know, why people use the program and how to get more involved. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge feather in their cap. It is. Anything 
questions? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of the council, in the interest of time, I would propose that we put off the capital improvement presentation. Uh, you have two uh, meetings scheduled for the uh, 15th and 17th, and uh, we could do it at the end of this meeting, but I think perhaps better would we start it fresh at, at 7 o'clock Monday evening, uh, if that's all right with the council. Then, uh, Madam Mayor, I appreciate the council's patience, and that concludes our uh, special order business. Uh, thank you very much. Next, we will have citizen comment. Given the number of speakers and the amount of time, if each person takes two and a half minutes, um, we should get through this in 45 minutes. So please be mindful of the time. First is Reverend Mark Dennis. Next, Reverend Karen Mosby Avery, Reverend Mark Copinger, and Susan Cooney. If you come over to the side and speak at that microphone. Well, that one's fine. Oh, if you want to move there. Okay. You can be anywhere you want. Sorry. It'll move fast. Mayor Tistall and City Council Manager and uh, members of the Council the city officers and leaders in this community, to the citizens who are representing and standing behind us on this initiative. I am Mark A. Dennis, Jr., the senior pastor of Second Baptist Church at 1717 Benson Avenue, a church that has been in this community since 18, uh, 1882 at the same block. I want to stand here today not only as senior pastor of Second Baptist Church, but also standing as the moderator for the Evanston Pastors Fellowship and representing the Interfaith Council and many other leaders, religious leaders in this community, totally more than 25 who have signed a letter of concern. It takes a rare moment for all of the religious leaders from different faiths and houses of worship to come together and agree and publicly share a concern. And this is one such initiative, the proposed ordinance 77010 has moved swiftly in the religious leadership community. Uh, more than uh, seven days ago, none of us heard about the initiative. None of us had been consulted, and the initiative has received overwhelming support, calls, and floods of emails from pastors, leaders, seminarians, leaders of institutions in this community. And so therefore, for the sake of time, I want to present to you persons who shall read the letter. We have copies. If those copies can be passed out to the council members, they have them now. Thank you very much. I shall call Reverend Karen Mosby Avery, who is the originator of the letter, and we concur with this, the elements and the tenets of this letter. I also call upon the pastor of First Presbyterian Church, Reverend Dr. Raymond Hilton, who shall give brief remarks, and I shall say just a few words at the end, and that shall represent our presentation to you this evening. I am uh, Karen Mosby Avery, pastor at Second Baptist Church, also 1717 Benson, uh, to Mayor Tisdall, the members of the Evanston City Council, the city manager. We members of the Evanston Faith Community urge you to postpone action on the proposed ordinance 77010 that calls for amending various portions of the zoning ordinance relating to religious institutions in the business, commercial, and downtown zoning districts. This ordinance impacts existing and future religious institutions in these designated areas and may have long-term ramifications on all religious institutions. Deliberation on and passage of such an ordinance requires input from Evanston faith leaders and congregations. We cannot support the broad generalized statements that religious institutions do not support or enhance the functioning of a vibrant commercial district or that religious institutions in commercial districts 
often have a distinct deadening effect on the district, nor can we unconditionally support an ordinance that appears to target any designated group of churches in our community. In this instance, the proliferation of storefront churches. We do not doubt that legitimate concerns prompted the City Council, the Planning and Development Committee, and the Zoning Committee to introduce this ordinance. However, it is an egregious act to pass such legislation without serious consideration of questions and concerns from all of Evanston's houses of faith. Evanston religious leaders and congregations must be consulted in matters that may have the potential of negatively impacting us and our significant contributions to the Evanston community. Our input is also needed to provide a more informed context for voting on this proposed ordinance. Therefore, we the undersigned request that the City Council does not proceed with the passing of this proposed ordinance today. Respectfully, respectfully submitted, Dr. Philip Amerson, President Garrett Evangelical Seminary, Reverend Harold Bar Barnwell, Bethel AME Church, Reverend Philip Bentley, Mount Zion Tabernacle Apostolic Church, Reverend Dr. Gessel Berry, Sherman United Methodist Church, Reverend Kenneth Cherry, Christ Temple Baptist Church, Reverend Mark A. Dennis Jr., Second Baptist Church, Reverend Dean L. Francis, First United Methodist Church, Bishop Fred Harris, Oasis Christian Ministries International, Raymond, Reverend Raymond Hilton, First Presbyterian Church, Reverend David P. Jones, Connections for the Homeless, Father Thomas Liberia, St. Athanasius Church, Rabbi Andrea London, Beth Emmett, the Free Synagogue, Bishop Carlos L. Moody, Faith Temple Church of God in Christ, Reverend Richard Mosley, Jr., Hemingway United Methodist Church, Reverend Karen Mosby Avery, Second Baptist Church, Susan Murphy, Interfaith Action of Evanston, Father Robert Oldershaw, St. Nicholas Church, Major Alberto Rapley, Sr., The Salvation Army, Major Felicia Rapley, The Salvation Army, Reverend Taurus Skurlock, Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, Dr. Drew Smith, Garrett Evangelical Seminary, Reverend Warren Smith, Fisher Memorial AME Zion Church, Reverend Leah Vandermeer, Canterbury Northwestern Episcopal Campus Ministry, Reverend Zali Webb, Friendship Baptist Church, and Reverend Clifford Wilson, Mount Pisgah Ministry. And I am Raymond Hilton. I'm the pastor of First Presbyterian Church, 1427 Chicago Avenue, and would just want to concur with what my colleagues have said, and then to add that this ordinance, in many respects, is too broadly stated, and again would ask, as has already been stated, that time be given to discuss this again, and to give uh, Houses of Faith the opportunity to look at this ordinance before such a broad sweeping ordinance is passed. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of our large community of, of faith members, uh, we think you have heard the messages uh, that we represent, a voice in this community. We are expecting a chance to be heard and to interact, and we are partners with you. And we, therefore, would like to have that consideration. To forbid us from our constitutional rights to even start as a storefront church and to penalize storefront churches where many churches in this community came out of that ilk is inappropriate. And to afford us lack of due process is inappropriate. And the implications are serious. Some churches are not affected but they stand because a few churches are targeted. And therefore, we would like, and simply are stating here today, that it will be good to have a conversation and to postpone your action until that has happened. Thank you on behalf of the leadership throughout Evanston representing the interfaith community. Thank you. Um. 
I'm Mark Coppinger. I'm pastor of Evanston Baptist Church, and we meet in the basement of the Fountain Square building. A little over a week ago, a student from Northwestern called and said, what is your statement of, about this action? And I said, I've never heard of this. I don't know what this is at all. So the next morning, I called uh, uh, the city manager and was referred to an attorney. And I thought, well, we're right in the middle of town. We're in the basement. And I'd read some of the comment online about uh, depression of this and that. And, and uh, I thought, well, I, we're not tax free. We're paying to the, to the building. And we're in the basement. And I don't think we're chilling anybody down there. Uh, uh, do we have to go? And he said, well, I think it may be. Uh, grandfathered in and or maybe you can make fresh application and and I, I thought that was so strange and I, and I also thought well here we go again uh, because we got started 10 years ago in the summer of 2000 and we had a, a church from the west side of Chicago bring an 80 voice choir over from Broadview Missionary Baptist Church and we had kind of a tussle to get a, a part concert and one of the councilmen uh, who's still here said uh, or the alderman said, uh, well, why are you here? Or what, why do you think you need to come in Evanston? Uh, and, uh, well, I said something about the gospel or something like that. But uh, I, I thought, wow, welcome to Evanston. Um, I was welcomed by Reverend Norton at uh, Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, who let us use their, their baptistry. And uh, Reverend Hanley at the, at the Presbyterian Church and Mar Martin McCorkle over at uh, Evanston Bible. So there was that welcome, but I thought there was a chilling effect. And then I saw the whole vineyard, I would call it a debacle, where they were being. And I, I think that maybe the council regrets that. And now, and now this. And, and so it just struck me as very, very odd. Um, I, I don't think we're, I, we have a deadening effect. We, we've paid almost $100,000 in rent uh, to the Fountain Square building. And we've spent, I, I think, about $60,000 for food for student meals, uh, lunch after church, and I'm a homeowner, and we buy a lot of stuff at CVS and Chipotle and Argo and so forth. Uh, people come in from, uh, sailors come in from Great Lakes on the train. We have a couple here from uh, 35th and Archer, uh, uh, who is, uh, he's um, an attorney, and she's a petroleum engineer, and they bring money in. So I, I just thought, this is, this is odd stuff. And then it hit me, when I first came to town, I see Wesley Asbury, all these names, and I started looking them up, and I, I found out that we have a bunch of Methodist divines that kind of started this place. And so we have a little handout here, if uh, you're welcome to it, and, and even Orrington, uh, and they talk about the gospel, and you look at the Northwestern seal, and it says in Greek, it says the word full of grace and truth, John Reverend. 1 14, and it says, uh, whatsoever things are true in Latin, and I thought, well, that's why we're here. We're trying to bring grace and truth. The first summer we were here. Reverend, you are welcome to be here, and Thank you. we do need grace and truth, but if you could wind down, that would I be will. wonderful. I will. I will. Sorry. I am so sorry. Uh, I will say there were one night, our first summer here, there were five shootings in one night, the first time in memory, and we took... Uh, Bible groups to those parks, to uh, closest Penny and Perry and some other parks, and I thought that's one reason we're here. I just submit to you that this is gratuitous, uh, that is, I think it's discriminatory, it's counterproductive. I don't think it's in the spirit of Evanston, uh, where money isn't the bottom line. We do the right thing here. I don't think this is the right thing. Thank you. Susan Cooney. Um, next, Mimi Pearson, Virginia Mann, and Lay Skinner. And please try to keep it short. Thank you. Uh, Mimi has already departed for the evening, so. I'm Virginia Mann of 3004 Normandy Place in Evanston. Since speaking to you on Saturday about the trees, some of my colleagues at Tree and I have immersed ourselves in the numbers surrounding the care of our beloved elm trees. While I don't have a Nobel Peace Prize, I do have a degree in economics, and I think enough understanding of budgets and cost analysis to be totally appalled by what I have found. After reviewing the numbers, it is beyond my comprehension that anybody would suggest cutting even a penny from our elm tree injection program. Not only has the current program been more than 99% effective, but the cost savings are astronomical. As you will see in the memo that was sent to you this evening, and I will distribute after this meeting, or after my comments, we have saved a tremendous amount of money by injecting our trees. In the past five years, Evanston injected about two-thirds of its elm trees. Of those not injected, we lost 491 trees. 
With the removal cost, according to the city's numbers five years ago, of $3,050 per tree, that comes to a total and real cost to Evanston taxpayers of $1,497,550. Those 491 trees could have been injected for a cost of $98,200. That means we wasted $1,399,350 tax dollars here in Evanston and unnecessarily lost 481 trees. To me, that is inexcusable. The proposal to cut back on injections puts trees that, are, that line our key parkways, such as McCormick Boulevard, Ridge Avenue, Sheridan Road, and others, at risk. Those 679 trees that are proposed to be cut out, out of the injection budget and put on the chopping block can be expected to die at a rate of 45 trees per year, costing Evanston taxpayers $411,750 each year in removal costs. That's far beyond the proposed savings, in, and I put that in quotes, of $60,000. In the memo, you'll see these numbers detailed further. All of this information is from previous city budgets or budget documents, um, related documents. I hope that you will join members of TREE and solidly oppose any cuts to the TREE injection program and in fact look to further save funds, Evanston funds, and preserve our environment by expanding the injection program to all elm trees in Evanston. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Mayor. Lay Skinner. Hi, I'm Lee Skinner. I live at 1123 Noy Street in Evanston. Um, I was sitting on an airplane reading an article about a character on Seinfeld called George Costanza, and in his real life, he purchased eight 30-year-old trees for $150,000 each. And it made me think about how we do not value our trees as valuable infrastructure of this city. He spent $1.2 million on eight trees so I decided to try to apply that $150,000 to the trees of our public forest. And I was shocked that today to learn that um, we only have 2,800 elm trees left that are public. When I started tying green ribbons on all of the elm trees of Evanston in like 2004 and 2005, we had 3,500. So we've lost 700 since 2004. That is shocking to me. Um, if you put $150,000 on all the trees that we have left, that's $420 million of infrastructure that we should not throw in the garbage can. Um, I couldn't believe that for this budget, you are actually suggesting cutting the significant elm tree program. I, I was shocked. It so clearly is less expensive than letting the trees catch the disease naturally and having to cut them down. The ratio is 30 to 1. I think I own a business and when I evaluate new programs, I try to do simple math to make it simple to think about whether it's worth evaluating it further. It basically costs $100 a year to vaccinate one tree and it basically costs $3,000 to cut an elm tree down. So if you do the ratio math, it takes 30 years for it to be more expensive um, than the vaccination program. It just use a calculator. There's 679 trees that you're thinking about cutting. If you just let them catch the disease naturally, and believe me, they will all be dead in the next 30 years, they'll be dead in the next 15 years, you'll spend $2 million cutting those trees down and have nothing to show for it. You could vaccinate them for 30 years and spend the same $2 million and have a lot to show for it. Um, so the next time I wanna talk about elm tree vaccinations is the year 2040 and I'll be 71 years old. Um, I also send money, uh, it's been a tight year for me, I got divorced last year, but I send money to like save the rainforest and it occurred to me we can't even keep our own forest alive here in Evanston. Um, global warming has been something I've been thinking about a lot lately and our big elm trees absorb a lot of carbon dioxide. They will be a very valuable infrastructure resource for you in the next 10 years and if I was a politician, I would want those big trees in my pocket they're gonna measure them someday and they're gonna say, oh, those absorb that many units of carbon dioxide every year. You're gonna want them in your city. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, next, Father David Jones, Reverend Warren Smith, Betty Esther, and Madeline Ducre. Good evening. Seems you're <coughs> condemned to hear from a bunch of clergy tonight, um, but I will be merciful and short. Uh, my name is Father David Jones. I live at 1229 Hinman Avenue. I'm a priest at St. Matthew's Episcopal Church in Evanston, and in my other life, I work and raise money for connections for the homeless. And so I have two congregations on my heart tonight. One of them will not be affected by the proposed Ordinance 77010, uh, that is St. Matthew's. The other one uh, and the people we seek to serve at Connections will be impacted hugely because the congregations that will be impacted by this ordinance are the ones that serve some of our clients most effectively and for the longest time. So please let us talk together about this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Warren Smith. I'm Pastor Fisher Memorial Church, which is in the fourth ward, and I also live in the fifth ward at 1931 Brown. Uh, my church represents more than 100 members who actually live, vote, and pay taxes in Evanston. We hope that tonight you would give this ordinance uh, 77010 your utmost consideration by postponing it so that we can have further discussions. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Betty Esther. I stay at 2130 Church Street. I'm here speaking on Ordinance 51-0-10, Amendment of Title VI, Chapter 6 of the City Code to, in to create the Community Accountability Truancy Program. I thought about this, and someone asked me, was I going to speak? And I thought about the time from the beginning of this ordinance that we have spent talking about this. If we as a community had put our minds and heart together to try to create a good program for the parents and children at our school, we would have a much better community, a much better ordinance, if you want to call that, than this. At the Human Service Committee last Monday, it was amended. This ordinance was amended to say that parents and guardians of children that are chronically truant would be cited and fined up to $100. They said that might be forgiven. And it also was pointed out that with this ordinance, the parents can be referred to the Community Accountability Board early, and then they can be threatened. The ordinance is a threat that we can fine you, but they don't say what happened after the fine if you don't pay it. But it's interesting that you're going to fine someone for something that they have not committed a crime yet or a law has been broken. The state law says a child cannot be considered truant until 180 days if the child has missed 180. 10%, which is 18 days of the school year. The child cannot be classified as a truant until the end of the school year. So if they go to the accountability people in the middle of the year, why are you putting there? The kids are not chronically truant. The school system, as Mr. Clark says, stated, has a set process that they must go through. They can't shortcut it. They have to do all of these things. They did say, yes, we can refer parents to the accountability board. They did say, well, parents that they have referred there did not want to deal with the accountability board. They did not tell us why. I'm sure the parents and the school teachers, I'm sorry, the student told them why. But we was not a prerequisite to that. Ms. Esther, could you wind down, please? Sure. Thank you. So, why are we having an ordinance that does not spell out how many times? Is it the first time the child get up, the parent get the citation, they go to the administrative judge? If they do not comply with the administrative judge, what happened? None of that is spelled out in this ordinance. It's a rush to judgment to put people 
in a situation into a judicial system when there is no law that they have Thank broken. You. My name is Madeline Ducree. I'm the next speaker. And I was wondering if it's okay if Betty continue. She can have my minutes. Yeah, she's and it is perfectly all right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Madeline. I have, we've done a lot of investigation. We've talked to a lot of people. And we have listened to the conversation and the things that they have. We asked for statistics. Um, we was told, well, you should get this and you should get that. We have tried to talk to the truant officer at the high school after Mr. Clark came and gave his statement, which was that the Evanston Township High School have not, he repeated it twice, have not asked for this ordinance that they did not ask for this, that they are, do support this. And we asked him, and he didn't get back to us, why are you shifting your responsibility to a private organization that really has no government power? But the city is willing to give them this, but they not. In an interagency agreement, it's going to be with the school. The school joint officer, which now cited the parents and issue a tissue that sent them to the regional um, educational person that charged them a fine of $500, and that fine can escalate up to $25,000 or 30 days in jail. That's still with the school system. But here we are going to have another organization that says, well, these people are not compliant, and it's not a government agency. Why are we doing this when the school system explained their job, what they was doing, in their program they have, is much more in detail, much more than what the accountability board is. Right. And some of the people that they are using are the same people that the school system use. So why are we paying twice? for the same service. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last, Michelle Stein and Junad Rizki. Oh, okay. Mr. Rizki. I would like to clarify a statement I made on Saturday during the budget hearing in regards to the use of contract employees in the fire department. I did not use the term volunteers or volunteer fire department in my statement. Such a department might exist in, exist in a rural community. I stated the fire department should use contract employees to, for 10 to 25 percent of their total staff. Bottom line, many suburb fire departments mix contractors with full-time employees. It is my understanding some Evanston firefighters are contractors in other departments. I seriously doubt the quality of the service would decline. Evanston Fire Department also uses other suburbs right now to bring it when they need extra manpower to fight the fires. So there's really not a lot of difference. Using quality contract, qualified contractors, it really doesn't do it, make any difference. By now, the council members understand 80% of the, the cost here is employees. Um, I realize this cannot happen during this budget cycle, but it, what should be looked at as a long-term th thing to happen. If e current economic conditions continue, it's very likely this council will be looking to close a fire station, or the other option would be to replace retiring firefighters with contractors. I believe it would save at least $600,000, maybe more. And I want to say one last thing about this thing with churches and thing, things here. The city is not too busy, and these, the building department, the zoning department, all these departments, there wasn't even a P&D meeting tonight. The city needs to find better things to do. Those departments need to be looked at very seriously to downsize them. And those, because I think you've got probably too many employees doing too little. It was interesting tonight up here on, on one of these pet presentations that basically, you, you say you basically put people homeless because you're of, of inspections. And I, I think that's something that makes no sense. So, thank you. Thank you. That concludes citizen comment. Alderman Rainey, could we have the consent agenda?
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first, I want to ask the council's indulgence. And um, under other committees, we have two economic development issues, 02 and I think 03. And those have to do with um, dealing with our economic development vision of retention of current businesses and industry. And if the council doesn't mind, I would like to yield the floor to Alderman Wynn, who is the economic development chairperson. Uh, we have with us tonight Mr. Ward uh, from Ward Manufacturing, who, if you all will allow, will make just a few comments. Um, the interesting part about Ward Manufacturing is that they were displaced from a downtown TIF district to their current location on Main Street. And now um, we're going to be able to help them with the current TIF district and other economic development incentives. So could we let Mr. Ward say a few words? I think we'd love to hear from him briefly. Do we need it first? I will be brief. My name is Michael Ward. Uh, Mr. Ward, if you would just hold for a minute, I'll move the resolution. Okay. Uh, this is 02, uh, item number 02, resolution 57R10, recommending class 6B status for Ward Manufacturing Company. Uh, the Economic Development Committee recommends the City Council approval of a resolution in support of Ward Manufacturing Company's efforts to obtain Class 6B classification from the Cook County Assessor for an industrial property located at 2322, uh, 2222 Main Street. This resolution from the City of Evanston is a required supplement in the ward in the ward men, in ward's application to the assessor. Class 6B is an assessment classification that is designed to encourage industrial development throughout Cook County. It offers reduced property tax assessment rates. Thank you. Second. And just before I, I'm going to go on to 03 and combine the both. Uh, I asked the council's approval for a recommendation for tax increment financing for Ward Manufacturing Company. The Economic Development Committee recommends City Council approval to provide $700,000 in financial assistance to Ward Manufacturing in the form of tax increment financing from the Southwest TIF. The Southwest TIF for fiscal year 2011 has an unbudgeted fund balance of approximately $1 million. Ward Manufacturing Company, a 70-year-old Evanston manufacturing company presently located at 2330 Main Street, is considering expanding to the property immediately to the east of Ward's existing facility at 2222 Main Street. Do I have a second? Second. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, we're very excited to be part of staying in the community. We've been part of this community for almost 70 years. We employ about 50 employees, looking to add to that by the expansion. This is our third expansion in Evanston. We started off uh, in a two-car garage in Chicago. My grandfather did and worked our way into a about 6,000 square foot building at 1218 Sherman. We then moved again to 1110 Emerson, which was right downtown here about a 12,000 square foot building. And our family has been excited to be here for a long time and we're excited to stay. And that was a big part of when we got moved this last time to 2230 Main Street, we were kind of stuck. And we've been working very diligently to keep our family business growing, employ more people and look to expand. We're looking at doubling our current size and by doing so with the 6B and moving next door and, in our opinion, beautifying that neighborhood and opening up jobs, uh, we're very excited to stay and thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, thank you very much. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, could we have a roll call vote? Madam Mayor, there are two items. There are two. Two items. If would Alderman Wynn, would you go over both of them again? I, I think if we took them as O2 and O3. All right, O2 and O3 on one roll call. Alderman Tendum. Aye. Alderman Grover. Aye. Alderman Rainey. Aye. Alderman Burris. Aye. Alderman Fisk. Aye. Alderman Jean Baptiste. Aye. 
Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Holmes? Aye. 9-0. Nine, Nine to nothing. We're glad you're staying in town. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Rainey. Yes. Um, first item on the consent agenda, Madam Mayor, it's City Council minutes of October 23rd, a special meeting. Uh, approval of the minutes of the regular council meeting of October 25. Under Administration and Public Works, the committee requests your approval for the payroll through um, October 24 in the amount of $2,261,674.63. Our bills through November 9 uh, in the amount of $2,945,173.32. Um, item A 3.1 is for action. It is a sole source purchase of a data park system upgrades to separate the upper deck of the city owned parking garage at 1800 Maple and 40,000, uh, that's at $47,360 and 2000 for upper deck parking uh, closed circuit television. Item A 3. Two is for action, and that is approval of the contracts for snow towing operations not to exceed $75,000. This is where we take on board um, independent contractors to help with snow removal towing. Um, item A4 is for action. It is approval of resolution 55R10, which authorizes the city manager to sign an extension of the city's electricity supply agreement with Mid-American Energy Company for a bundled amount of 0 .0551 cents per kilowatt hours. Um, next item is A5. It is for action resolution 58R10, which authorizes the city manager to sign the resolution of authorization for the Illinois Park and Recreation Facility construction grant application for the Ecology Center greenhouse project. If awarded, this would provide us with 375,000 of the 500,000 required to restore the, the structure with the city only paying 25% or $125,000. Um, next is A6, it's for action. It's, um, this has been held in committee. Um, it has to do with the light at uh, the Northwestern entrance at Garrett Place. It will be addressed by the committee chair. Next is Ordinance 36010, establish a Sheridan Road traffic signal at Northwestern University entrance at Garrett Place. This is just for introduction tonight. Ordinance 8010, which amends uh, the tax imposed for motor fuel tax from three cents to four cents, and this is on gasoline and is for introduction. Next item is Ordinance 81010. It is also just for introduction. It amends Section 32992, the Municipal Utility Tax, and increases the, the rate for the utility tax based on the amount of energy used per user. Item A10 is also for introduction and amends Public Ways, Chapter 2, Section 5 of the City Code to increase the right-of-way permit fees to $1.50 per lineal foot per week in all cases. Um, for example, parkways, uh, alleys, streets, etc. Ordinance uh, 83010 is for action. It authorizes the sale at the Obanoff Auction Services for the sale of surplus fleet vehicles. Ordinance 84010 amends the city code to establish a three-way stop at Greenwood Street and Gray Avenue and is for action. Ordinance 86010 amends various sections of the code, uh, municipal uh, motor vehicles and traffic, um, and it has to do with removing all parking, in other words, making parking illegal now, on the east side of Chicago Avenue from Howard Street to the CTA tracks. Under Planning and Development, Ordinance 77010 is off, it's off, mm. it's off, the consent agenda. Um, item P2 is Ordinance 78010, a text amendment to the zoning ordinance to allow animal hospitals as special uses in all business and commercial districts. That is for action. And 
um, ordinance, uh, wait, Township of Evanston October monthly bills were now under Human Services, H1, uh, in the amount of $101,873.20 for action. Ordinance 51010 amends Title IX, Chapter 6 of the Code to create a Community Accountability Truancy Ordinance. This is just for introduction uh, for this evening. Ordinance 85010 amends various sections of uh, Title IX, Public Safety, Chapter 4, uh, Dogs, Cats, Animals, and Fowl of the City Code, and limits the, uh, the number of coops per ward to three of the 20 um, licenses allowed. All right, well, it's for introduction tonight, so if you want to, um, if the committee chair would like to address that at the time, but it is for introduction. Are you saying it is held in committee and not for introduction? No. No. It's, no. For, it's it for, for introduction, it. okay. Um, next, uh, approval of the 2011 budget and agreement with Downtown Evanston in the amount of 72000 for their annual budget assistance and 90,000 for the city's portion of the annual landscaping and maintenance services contract. Um, items uh, 02 and 03 were already handled by Alderman Wynn, the chairman of the Economic Development Committee. And then finally, we have ordinance 79010, which amends 56, 562 of the city code to add an alderman to the Housing Commission, and this is for action tonight. Madam Mayor, you've made no appointments for tonight, and therefore I move the council. Alderman Rainey, yes, just for clarification, uh, you did move both sets of minutes, the special city council yes, meeting and the regular. Yes, Thank you. So I, I move the consent agenda. Second. City Clerk, could you call the roll? Alderman Tindem? Aye. Alderman Grover? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Burris? Aye. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Jean-Baptiste? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Holmes? Aye. 9-0. Nine, Nine to nothing, the consent agenda passes. Alderman Jean-Baptiste? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, for item A6, um, this matter was uh, moved at the committee level. And of course, it was just moved by the uh, by Alderman Rainey, um, but we decided to hold it in committee, and so it would not be for action here on the council tonight. Okay. So I can tell you right now. Does that conclude your report? That concludes my report. Thank you. Alderman Rainey, Planning and Development. Um, Madam Mayor, and Planning and Development, the ordinance which is for um, action is Ordinance 77010, amends various portions of the zoning ordinance relating to religious institutions in business, commercial, and downtown zoning districts um, is for action, and I move approval, and I'd appreciate an opportunity to speak to it. Is there a second? <coughs> Second. Um, what is being proposed tonight is simply requiring churches to be a special use in commercial and residential districts, and I see also in downtown <coughs> districts. Um, what we have found out is that this is uh, the norm in most communities that uh, churches in these districts are a special use. I don't remember the discussion um, ever dealing with the fact that churches um, or properties owned by churches in these districts are off the tax rolls. That has not been the issue. The issue has really been in those districts, um, and this was brought to the zoning committee by me, um, because I represent Howard Street. And as you know, on Howard Street, we have a serious problem with a stagnant economic development situation. Uh, we have struggling businesses attempting to eke out an existence 
in some blocks where there are seven storefront churches. They happen to be storefront churches. They are not cathedrals. There's not much I can do about it. They're just little tiny lots all along Howard Street, which is probably the most undeveloped commercial uh, or business district in the city of Evanston. And it appears um, that the main reason for that is, for example, in the 700 block of Howard Street, there are seven storefront churches that are closed to the public, to the congregations all week long. Business districts and retail districts thrive on the customer activity in and out all day long. Um, and that just doesn't happen there. It is shuttered, the windows are closed, it's, it's very, very quiet. There's no activity. So we looked into the regulations in other communities and why is it that only Howard Street really in Evanston and maybe maybe Simpson, um, why, why is it that it's so overloaded with, with <coughs> storefront churches and no commercial to speak of? Um, we have several service operations there. Uh, we have a shipping facility, we have a clothing boutique, we have a spa, several hair shops, um, it's it, laundromat. It, it, the, reason, the reason is, is because there's no regulation governing that there can be so many or they have to be so many, dis such a distance uh, between. And so as a matter of fact, when landlords have fallen upon hard times, they have rented to whoever, whoever shows up with a pile of cash. And that's exactly what has happened on Howard Street. Believe me, I know Howard Street better than anybody in this room. I know every single address. I know everything about Howard Street. And I think I probably wouldn't be making this recommendation if there was all this activity. I, you know what, I never opened my mouth while you were speaking, and I'm going to ask you, as a man of the cloth, to give me the same respect. I would never have talked while you were talking. Um, I'm going to do everything in my power to make Howard Street as vibrant as your downtown, as your Main Street business district, as your Central Street business district, and that can't happen with shuttered storefronts almost six days a week. It can't happen. It can't happen. And things are going to turn around. And so nobody is banning churches. Nobody. You're, you've, you've been misled. Nobody is banning churches. All we're doing is asking that the same as in other communities, that they be a special use. Do you know that if a restaurant um, you know, when Heckey's goes in on Howard Street, he has to get a special use. What makes a church better than a restaurant? What makes a church better than a daycare center? What makes a church better than any other use in town that has to have a special use? Banks sometimes need a special use. A pharmacy with a drive through needs a special use. It has, it has absolutely not, nothing to say about the quality of the use. It simply says that a church has to have a special use, just like a restaurant, just like many, many other uses, schools, etc. That's all it says. So if you've been told that we're banning churches, that is just not happening. Just not happening. Alderman Wilson. <coughs> Thank you. And I understand that that's, that's a, uh, a significant and a, and a legitimate concern, but I think what we ought to do in this situation is to take a, a little bit more of a, uh, a global look at how this is going to impact the community as a whole and other areas of the city. I think it seems to me that it's a little bit more tailored towards a specific issue or a specific problem. And from some of the comments and information that I've heard and the feedback we've got, 
uh, that we've gotten, I, I think that we might be inadvertently creating impacts that we are not intending to create. So in my view, I think we should defer on this a little bit just to take a little bit closer look at the overall impact and see if we can't tailor it to be a little more closely suited to the specific problem that you're facing on, uh, on Howard Street and maybe in other areas. Madam Mayor, I would, I would like to move to delete the downtown from the ordinance because I, mean, I, I don't know why that is in there, but the downtown district, regardless of what the underlying line zoning is, there is a downtown district, and I would like to delete that. And I'll be glad to send this back to the plan commission to take a look at it. But if we're interested in economic development, and if we're interested in saving a certain community in this town, I think we have to, as everybody says, think outside the box. You cannot, you cannot sentence Howard Street to its demise, and it, it has made very little progress. I've been up and down that street with the city manager, with every inspector in this town, with everybody from economic development, and in the last five years, there has not been one change, not one change, not, not one at all, and, and that's a crime. And for this council to sentence a street to, to that is irresponsible and disrespectful to the people struggling to make a living on that street. Shame on you. Alderman Shaw Baptiste. I think you leaping to conclusion to be shaming anybody where we have not spoken on the issue. I move to years. hold this matter in committee for further discussion and consideration. Can I get a second? Second. second? second. All right, it's been moved and seconded that it be held in committee. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Alderman Grover, I assume you don't need to speak on the issue, or Alderman Holmes, did you wish to? Well, yes, I, I would still like to speak. Oh, I know, but I, I, I just need to say this because I think that we also, we've heard from the community of faith this evening, and I think we need to let them know how there can still be uh, some dialogue with them because I think that's what they asked for. I don't think they're opposing it. I think they said that. They're not, they're not uh, supporting it or opposing it, but I think that we need to give them some directions in terms of how they might be able to have some dialogue uh, with us, because I think that's what they asked for. If I'm, if I'm mistaken, fine, but I think that's what I heard. And I don't know if we're yeah, holding yeah. it over, if that would happen here at the council level no. or, or oh, not. The, yeah, the committee chair could probably speak on the process and when the next meeting is. Alderman Rain. Um, well, I would suggest at our next committee meeting that it be on our agenda. Okay. I mean, it, which this is, is the first night in, in my history on the council that I can remember not having a planning and development committee Correct. meeting. So, right. I mean, the very unusual situation tonight. Um, so at our next meeting, um, you know, you could come. Next. But, uh, you know, our next meeting is on November 22nd. November 22nd. Okay. November 22nd, the council sessions start at 545 with administration and public works and immediately following that is um, PND. Madam Mayor, I would like to invite the faith community to join me in a walk down Howard Street. Um, I will tell you when I'm available and we will walk during the day down Howard Street so you can see what is causing me so much pain and the pain being caused towards, and I'm not just talking to you, by the way. I'm talking to all of you who are here uh, in opposition to this ordinance uh, amendment. It is, um, I'll tell you what, if you will, uh, I will post a, a notice on the city's uh, website about the date for the walk down Howard Street. And I invite the press to join us, please. So is that okay with you? It'll be during the day, during the week. Okay? All right. 
I'm talking to everybody. <laughs> if you would like to come, be my guest. Um, Thank you. Let me I, say I, this. Excuse me, Madam yeah, Mayor. Right. I don't know I, when I, it is, Lionel. I haven't looked at my calendar. I, I, I'm not asking you that. It's going to be about a two-hour visit. I'm not asking you that. Come on. <laughs> I think that we've got to be more collegial and friendlier in the resolution of this. And let me propose how we do that, right? Because I don't know whether everybody can get access to uh, uh, an, the internet and website, even though that is the trend. And so in order to ensure, and I think it's a good thing, for people to take a walk down Howard Street so that they can participate in the process. And Reverend Dennis, who is um, the spokesperson now for the, um, I don't know what the, the, the group's name. Ministers Alliance. Is it the, the Pastors Alliance? Pastor Fellowship. Pastor Fellowship, I think, would be the, the principal person. Um, and so I would suggest that maybe there be some numbers exchanged. Okay, why don't you organize it and let me know? No, I, what I'm going to do is refer it to the city manager, okay. who is our principal uh, administrator, Thank to see know. if we could help coordinate some of that. So city manager, would, would you accept to help coordinate that? Absolutely. Okay, great. So um, Reverend Dennis, if you would get um, the city manager's information, it's on the website, you could call him, he can coordinate, he can be the person who interacts with um, Alderman Rainey to make sure that everybody is uh, properly notified <coughs> as to when and what time and where people would meet. Thank you. Let me invite my fellow uh, council members to make a trip down. I'm on Howard Street all the time. I understand. I understand oh, your no. pain. I understand well, your then pain. You're not invited. I, I, understand. <laughs> <laughs> I know your pain. I would like to encourage you all to come to the Planning and Development Committee meeting because of the way that it's structured. It's much easier to have a dialogue at a committee meeting. Um, and I'm sorry that the council meeting structure does not really accommodate that. Um, Alderman Fisk, you have no report? All right. Other committees, everything passed. So we are at call of the wards. Alderman Tendum? I have nothing tonight, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Alderman Grover? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Again, congratulations to Professor Dale Mortensen. I'm glad he and his wife Beverly were here tonight, and I'm sure that after his visit here in the council chambers, the White House will be nothing special. Uh, thank you to Alderman Holmes for collaborating on our combined ward meeting, and special thanks to city staff Jeff Murphy, Paul Schneider, uh, Director Suzette Robinson, Police Officers Ron Bloomerberg, Lieutenant Ron Godby from Northwestern's Police Department, and City Manager Bob Kowitz for lending their expertise to, this, to the discussion. And please remember our veterans on Thursday. Thank you. Alderman Rainey? Um, I think this council needs to get a grip on its agenda. Tonight, tonight just didn't work at all. There's way too much pre-council business stuff going on. I, I, I mean, that we had a Nobel Prize winner here tonight should have been enough. <laughs> I mean, you just can't beat that and you can't top it. Um, I find that when our meetings go on and on and on and on with presentation after presentation after presentation, it's just not helpful. Um, people get tired. They, some people get bored. People in the audience get up and walk out. And so um, I, I don't think it works. I don't think it works. And I think maybe council members or the rules committee in some way need to engage with members of our staff in putting together the agenda. Second of all, I would like uh, Paul D'Agostino and Doug Gaynor to put together a detailed response to this fabulous information that we got tonight from the tree people. Um, the fact that we're going to save a few bucks and not inoculate trees that could in fact result, because we've been here in the past when these trees were being uh, cut down. Um, it, it, it doesn't make economic sense. 
So I'm going to encourage you to do that. Uh, regardless how the faith community finds out about the trip down Howard Street, I encourage you to participate. I encourage the press. I encourage the public. I, while Alderman uh, Jean-Baptiste is always on Howard Street, I know many of you are not, and I think you will be appalled by what you see, especially if you're familiar with other business districts in this town. We have the most fabulous business organization coming together now on Howard Street. They are fighting to survive, they're struggling, they're excited, they're moving forward, they're hoping to gain customers, but it's not easy. And so any help the faith community certainly can give us in generating activity at these businesses, that would just be great. We're, we're really hoping for your help. Um, but I think the most important thing for you to do is to come and see what I'm talking about. I think, I think when I've taken our staff down that street, when the city manager and, and other members of the staff have come down for the first time, um, they were not impressed. So I'm hoping that you all can help because that's all I'm trying to do is to help my people. Alderman Burris. Hi, I just learned this evening that the uh, crosswalk at Oakton and Barton is scheduled to be painted with new signs on Thursday. Uh, which is very exciting. And uh, thanks again to Ward Manufacturing for staying at Evanston. I really were so unbelievably excited. And uh, I would echo Alderman Rainey's comments about Howard Street. Um, people that don't walk down it regularly really should. Um, and people from other wards that have no idea what's going on in South Evanston, um, go down and see what's happening. It's I'm there frequently and uh, got some cool boutiques there, um, but we need more activity. So um, get out of your wards. Come down to Howard. Thank you, Alderman Fisk. No report. Thank you, Alderman Shaw Baptiste. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I know the council is interested in uh, what's going on in the West Side uh, Business District of Dempster and Dodge. We are uh, getting ourselves together. Uh, we have a meeting on the 12th at 9 a.m. to do some brainstorming and to put some plans into action. Uh, we also, you know, some of you have been concerned, you drive by the Sienna building and you wonder what is going on. Uh, we are meeting with the residents and with um, some of our staff members um, because there have been some activities. Uh, we need to share that information with the Seattle residents and the surrounding and residents in the surrounding area who have become concerned about the impact of the uh, stagnation there on their um, property value. Um, additionally, we will be meeting with um, our folks at Optima Views and the business uh, members business uh, businesses in that neighborhood um, just to prepare for the holidays and to share with them information about safety and also um, they do have some concerns about garbage pickup and et cetera et cetera we'll be sharing with them at that time and whatever other questions that they might have so um, we'll come back and give you a report as to what we found out thank you thank you alderman Wynn. Alderman Wilson. No report. Thank you, Alderman Holmes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I um, just wanted to um, invite everyone to the Shorefront Leg uh, Legacy Center's grand opening on um, this Saturday, November 13th at 3 p.m. at 2010 Dewey in room 206. Um, I hope people will stop by and see this wonderful facility. Uh, also, um, the First Church of God in Christ Christian Life Center will begin celebrating their 100th anniversary on, um, let's see, I think it's uh, November the 17th through the 21st. And last, uh, the regular Fifth Ward meeting will be on next Thursday, 
November 18th, and we will have um, representatives from Viola present to begin to discuss uh, plans that they want to do to enhance their area, but also uh, to hear from the residents of that area in terms of uh, concerns that they have about the property. And Alderman Jean Baptiste and I will be co sponsoring uh, that meeting. And I too would um, want to thank uh, Alderman Grover uh, for um, finding the space at Northwestern for us to do a joint fifth and seventh ward um, meeting on the 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? <laughs> thank you. City Clerk? Alderman Kendall? Aye. Alderman Grover? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Burris? Aye. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman John Baptiste? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. 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 It's good to hear, but hard.